This video is part three of reading The Secret of the Golden Flower. This is an ancient, uh, well, not that ancient, actually. It's from the 17th century, but it's probably ancient wisdom. Uh, and it was translated first into English in 1931. And the English translation was based on a German translation by a man named Richard Wilhelm. And I just found out, and that was from 1929. So Richard Wilhelm translated it. He was a, a missionary to China and he found this, uh, I guess, a manuscript in, in a bookstore and he he, tra he ended up translating, translating it. And um, it's called The Secret of the Golden Flower. And I just found out that uh, Wilhelm died the following year. After it was published in 1930, he, he died. So this was like the last thing he did, I guess, in his life as he translated this work. And it has become a very important work in, in the West. I don't know about the East. It seems like it's more imper important because of Carl Jung. Carl Jung was Wilhelm's friend. Um, Jung was Swiss, but on the German side, I guess. And, and he knew Wilhelm, who was German. And... Uh, I don't know that much else. I, I really <laughs> just the little I know, I'm telling you what the little I know. So um, we're reading chapter three and we're just talking about it. And this is just like reading it basically for the first time. And what what can we glean <laughs> from the reading? And I'm, I've been comparing it to universal spiritual themes and also to the universal spiritual themes found in A Course in Miracles because that's been what I've been focused on for a while now. So, and some of you who have been following this channel have, have also heard a lot about A Course in Miracles, not so much about this. And uh, this is like Eastern thought. So here we go. Um, chapter three, turning around the light and keeping to the center. Section one, Master Lu Dongbin said, what is the origin of the term turning the light around? It began with the adept Wen Shi. When the light is turned around, the energies of heaven and earth, yin and yang, all congeal. This is what is called refined thought, pure energy or pure thought. Number two, or section two, paragraph two. When one begins to apply this charm, it is, if, it is as if in the middle of existence there is nothingness. When in the course of time the work is completed and beyond the body there is a body, it is as if in the middle of nothingness there is existence. Paragraph 3. Only after concentrated work of a hundred days will the light be genuine. Only then will it become spirit fire. After a hundred days from a point of real young in the light, suddenly a millet pearl is born by itself just as an embryo forms from the intercourse of a man and a woman. Then you should attend it calmly and quietly. The turning around of the light is the firing process. Paragraph four. In the original creation, there is young light, which is the determining factor. In the material world, it is the sun. In a human, be in a human being, it is the eyes. Spiritual and consciousness energy runs away or leaks mechanically through the eyes. Therefore, the way of the golden flower depends wholly on the method of reversal. Five, turning the light around is not just turning around the essence of one body, but turning around the very energy of creation. It is not stopping wandering thoughts only temporarily, but directly emptying samsara, the turning of the wheel of a thousand kalpas. So emptying samsara the characters, I guess, means the turning of the wheel of a thousand kalpas. And it's interesting that it's using, this is a Chinese um, channeled scripture, but it's using Sanskrit, right? Samsara is a Sanskrit term. And kalpa is also a Sanskrit term. So it's also Buddhist. So, so it's probably influ the influence of Buddhism. Um, six, therefore the duration of a breath means a year 
according to human reckoning and a hundred years measured by the long night of the ninefold underworld underworld seven after a baby gives the first cry ho at birth he grows up according to the circumstances and until his old age he will never look backward when his young energy fades and disappears he enters the ninefold underworld the surangama sutra says through pure thoughts one can fly through emotions one falls when students take little care of their thoughts and give too much weight to their emotions they fall into the lower ways only through observing clearly and making one's breathing making one's breathing quiet can one reach perfect enlightenment this is application of the method of reversal paragraph 8 in the yin in the yin convergence classic it is said the eyes are the key. In Suen, from the inner classic of the Yellow Emperor, it is said, the essence of the human body flows upward and fills the empty apertures. If one understands this, one has the key to attaining immortality and, tr and transcending the world. This is a practice that pervades the three religions of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. Paragraph 9. The light is not in the body alone, nor is it only outside the body. Mountains, rivers, sun, moon, and the whole earth are all this light, so it is not only in the self. All the operations of intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom are also this light, so it is not only outside the self. The light of heaven and earth fills the universe. The light of one individual also naturally extends through the heavens and covers the earth. Therefore, once you turn the light around, heaven and earth, mountains and rivers are all turned around. 10. The essence of man fills upwards to the eyes. That is the great key of the functioning of the human body. You should think about this. If you do not practice meditation every day, this light flows out. Who knows when it will stop. If you only sit quietly for a quarter of an hour, you get rid of 10,000 kalpas and a thousand lives. Inconceivably, the 10,000 dharmas all revert to stillness with this wonderful truth. Paragraph 11. When the practice is started, one proceeds from the shallow to the deep, from the coarse to the fine. It's always better if there's no interruption. The effort is the same from beginning to end, but its experience during the process is personal and only known to oneself. Only when you return to the state of the unbounded ocean and the empty sky, and one accepts 10,000 dharmas just as they are, then you have got it. 12. When the sages have passed, what the sages have passed on has not departed from inner illumination. Confucius called it ultimate knowledge. Buddha called it the observing mind. Lao Tse called it inner observation. It is all the same. 13. Anyone can talk about inner illumination, but one cannot master it if one does not know what these words mean. It means returning from the lower heart to the origin of form and spirit. Within our six-foot body, we must strive for the body, which existed before the laying down of heaven and earth. Nowadays, people sit and meditate one or two hours, still immersed in their lower self, and call this inner illumination. How can anything come of it? 14. The two founders of Buddhism and Taoism have taught that one should look at the tip of one's nose, but they did not mean that one should concentrate on the tip of the nose. Neither did they mean that while one's eyes are looking at the tip of the nose, one's thoughts should be concentrated on the middle yellow court. Wherever the eyes look, one's attention follows. How can one direct one's attention at two places at the same time? This is just like taking the finger pointing at the moon for the moon itself. 15. What, what then is really meant by this? The idea of focusing on the tip of the nose is very clever. The nose must serve the eyes as a guideline, but the nose itself is not the issue. If one's eyes are wide open, one looks into the distance so the nose is not seen. If the eyelids shut too much so that the eyes close, then again the nose is not seen. When the eyes are open too wide, one's attention is easily scattered outward. When they are closed too much, one easily gets lost in dreamlike states. Only when the eyelids are pro lowered properly halfway is the tip of the nose seen in just the right way and therefore it is taken as a guideline. 16. 
The main thing is to lower the eyelids in the right way and then to allow the light to come in naturally. You don't need to make any special effort. Looking at the tip of the nose serves only as the beginning of the inner concentration so that the eyes are brought into the right direction for looking and then are held to the guideline. After that, one can let it be. That is the way a mason hangs up a plumb line. As soon as he is hung up, as soon as he has hung it up, he guides his work by it without continually bothering himself to look at the plumb line. 17. Stopping and observing is a Buddhist method that originally was not secret. One looks attentively with both eyes at the tip of the nose, sits upright in a comfortable position, and focuses, focuses the heart around the center, which is also called the yellow middle in Taoism. It, is not it, is, it not necessarily means the center of the head. It is only a matter of fixing one's attention on the point which lies between the two eyes. Light is something extremely volatile. When one fixes the attention on the midpoint between the two eyes, the light naturally enters. One doesn't need to direct the attention to the middle castle. These few words include all essential points. As for the rest, matters of entering and exiting stillness, the pre prelude and the aftermath, one can check the book small stopping and observing for a reference. 18. Focusing around the center is a very subtle expression. The center is omnipresent. The whole universe is contained in it. This indicates the crucial point of creation and through this one enters the gate. One takes focusing as a hint so that one doesn't become rigidly fixed. This expression is alive and subtle. 19. Stopping and observing are inseparable. They mean concentration and insight. When thoughts arise, you, ne you don't need to sit still as before, but you should investigate this thought. Where is it? Where does it come from? Where does it go? Repeat this inquiry until you realize it cannot be grasped. Then you will see where thoughts arise. After that, you don't need to seek out the point of arising anymore. Having looked for my mind, I realize it cannot be grasped. I have pacified your mind for you. Paragraph 20, last paragraph. This is right observation. What opposes this is incorrect. Once one realizes it cannot be grasped, one keeps practicing stopping, followed by observing, and keeps practicing observing, followed by stopping. This is the double cultivation of stopping and observing. This is turning the light around. The turning around is stopping. The light is observing. Stopping without observing is called turning around without light. Observing without stopping is called having the light without turning it around. Remember this. It's fascinating, right? This is so much in here. <laughs> um, don't think that I'm going to explain this <laughs> or anything like that, but, but, but I, as if I could, but I, I'm, I'm just um, maybe just going to... There were 20 paragraphs. So this is a lot of paragraphs. I'm just going to go for about 10 minutes right now, and we're going to say what we can say in, the, in, in about 10 minutes or so, I hope. Maybe more. I don't know. So Master Lu said, what is the origin of the term turning the light around? And that's the name of this chapter, turning around the light and keeping at the center is the name of this chapter. It began with the Adept Wenshi. When the light is turned around, the energies of heaven and earth, yin and yang, all congeal. This is what is called refined thought, pure energy, or pure thought. So turning the light around brings together these energies, the yin and yang, heaven and earth. And then you get refined thought, pure energy, or pure thought. Paragraph two, when one begins to apply this charm, it is as if in the middle of existence there is nothingness. When in the course of time the work is completed and beyond the body there is a body, it is as if in the middle of nothingness there is existence. You turned it around, right? You turned it around from at first, at the beginning, in the middle of existence, there is nothingness. And then at the end of it, in the middle of nothingness, there is existence. And I think when it says beyond the body, there is a body, this is referring to the Dharma body that was talked about earlier in the earlier chapters. Paragraph three. Only after concentrated work of a hundred days will the, light, will the light be genuine. Only that, then will, will it 
becomes spirit fire after 100 days from a point of real young in the light. Suddenly a millet pearl is born by itself just as an, as an embryo forms from the intercourse of a man and a woman. Then you should attend it calmly and quietly. The turning around of the light is the firing process. So you do this work for 100 days and it becomes spirit fire. And you, you get a pearl. And the pearl is like an embryo, right? You've, you've created something and, and now you, and now you, you watch it grow, <laughs> but it takes a hundred days apparently from this. For in the original creation, there's yang light, which is the determining factor. In the material world it is the sun. So the sun represents the masculine energy. In a human being, it is the, uh, it is the eyes. So the eyes are sy symbolic of, of the young. And this is all about the eyes. This is talking about the eyes, right? Over and over again here. Spiritual and consciousness energy runs away or leaks mechanically through the eyes. This is what I heard from the beginning when I started practicing yoga. They said, you know, that you, um, uh, energy comes out of your eyes, you know. Therefore, the way of the golden flower depends wholly on the method of reversal. So you're reversing the, the flow of the energy outward and and you're turning your sight inward i so i think that's ki kind of symbolic you know it's it's not just saying well energy is released through your eyes it's also saying you know you're you're turning your sight inside yourself otherwise you get you get lost in the illusion i'm using a term from also Buddhism and Hinduism, but, but the Course in Miracles, you know, you get lost in the, in the drama and the illusion and you, um, and you, and you end up never going within yourself. Paragraph five, turning the light around is not just turning around the essence of one body, but turning around the very energy of creation. It is not stopping wandering thoughts only temporarily, but directly emptying samsara, which this calls the turning of the wheel but usually samsara means, in, in Hinduism, Buddhism means the wheel, the cycle of, of suffering, of rebirth, of life, death, and rebirth. And, and the whole idea is you want to end the cycle of samsara. So emptying samsara of a thousand kalpas, and I believe kalpas are like a period of time. You know, kalpas is, is, is some period of time. I forget how long it is. Um, we'll go on though. Paragraph six, therefore the duration of a breath means a year according to human reckoning and a hundred years measured by the long night of the ninefold underworld. It's going to talk about the breath. Let's just leave that because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, we'd have to think about that more than I have time for, right? or I want to give time for right now. Um, paragraph seven, after a baby gives the first cry, ho, at birth, he grows up according to the circumstances and until his old age, he will never look backward. I think maybe that means never looks, he never looks inward. When his young energy fades and disappears, he enters the ninefold underworld. So I think this, what this means is that, um, that, you know, if you don't cultivate the young in your life, if you don't look inward or backward, um, you will, you know, you, you go to the underworld. <laughs> the Surangama, the Surangama Sutra, which I, 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 I'm, I'm sure is a Buddhist Sutra says through pure thoughts, one can fly. Through emotions, one falls. When students take little care of their thoughts and give too much weight to their emotions, they fall into the lower ways. Only through observing clearly and making one's breathing quiet can one reach perfect enlightenment. This is application of the method of reversal. So this makes more sense, right? This, this is a little bit more understandable here. <clears throat> My teacher used to say, um, she, she would say to us, Emotions, children, my children, very bad. <laughs> this is saying the same. Through emotions, one falls. You don't want to give in to the emotions. 
the emotions are keep you locked into the illusion, into, into the ego mind. Um, and you fall into the lower ways. So you want to learn to observe clearly. And that would be, you know, obser observation means not ju without judgment without agitation, without judgment, without agitating your mind. And, and, and that leads to a quiet mind and quiet breath. And you can reach perfect enlightenment. And this is the application of the method of reversal. Eight, in the Yin Conversions Classic, it is said, the eyes are the key. In Suen, from the Inner Classic of the Yellow Emperor, it is said, the essence of the human body flows upward and fills the empty apertures. I think that means the eyes, right? The empty apertures. If one understands this, one has the key to attaining immortality and transcending the world. This is a practice that pervades the three religions of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. So it's, you know, this is, this is a, a Chinese text that was channeled and it, it's Taoist, I guess, but it's also bringing together Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. And obviously it's using, it's using Buddhist terminology. Um, it's also using Taoists like yin and yang. Nine, the light is not in the body alone, nor is it only outside the body. Mountains, rivers, sun, moon, and the whole earth are all this light. So it is not only in the self. All the operations of intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom are also this light. So it is not only outside the self. The light of heaven and earth fills the universe. The light of one individual also naturally extends through the heavens and covers the earth. Therefore, once you turn the light around, heaven and earth, mountains and rivers are all turned around. I think this is saying that the light light is everywhere, right? It's, it's, it's within and it's without. Fills the universe. 10, the essence of man fills upwards to the eyes. That is the great key of the functioning of the human body. You, sh you should think about this, right? Think about your eyes and that your eyes are up here, right? <laughs> they're not down there. They're up here. What does that mean? Sight. Why, why do we see? Why do we have eyes up here? <laughs> why is their head up here? Have you thought about this lately? I have not. But we could start. That's an interesting idea. Um... You should think about this. If you do not practice meditation every day, this light flows out. Who knows when it will stop? If you only sit quietly for a quarter of an hour, you get rid of 10,000 kalpas and a thousand lives. <laughs> Inconceivably, the 10,000 dharmas all revert to stillness with this wonderful truth. Now, this is fascinating. I'll tell you why, because we just were reading in A Course in Miracles today, the workbook lesson is talking about how a Course in Miracles, the teachings of A Course in Miracles, the lessons can save you time. And it actually says, it doesn't say a thousand lives, but it says a thousand years. <laughs> you could save a thousand years. <laughs> this says a thousand lives. And I was talking about how A Course in Miracles seems to be implying reincarnation, that, that, that reincarnation is a fact, but it never outright says it, right? Um, this definitely is saying it, right? You get rid of a 10,000 kalpas and a thousand lives. So that's very interesting. You know, it's an interesting synchronicity and that's bringing Carl Jung into it because <laughs> he, he was the one that coined the term synchronicity. Paragraph 11, when the practice is started, one proceeds from the shallow to the deep, from the coarse to the fine. It's always better if there's no interruption. The effort is the same from beginning to end but its experience during the process is personal and only known to oneself. Only when you return to the state of the unbounded ocean and, and the empty sky, and one accepts 10,000 dharmas just as they are, then you have got it. You're proceeding from the shallow to the deep, from the coarse to the fine. You don't want to have interruption. The experience is personal. That's interesting. It's a personal experience, only known to yourself. Only when you have re returned to the state of the unbounded ocean and the empty sky have you got it. Very interesting. <laughs> Paragraph 12. What the sages have passed on has not departed from inner illumination. Confucius called it 
ultimate knowledge. Buddha called it the observing mind. Lao Tse called it inner observation. It is all the same. So this is like talking about how all these traditions are getting at the same thing, right? They're all pointing to the same thing. Fingers pointing to the moon, right? Pointing to, it's different language, but they're talking about the same thing. And these are the, these are the, you know, the founders of these religions, Confucius, Buddha, and Lao Tse. 13, anyone can talk about inner illumination, but one cannot master it if one does not know what these words mean. It means returning from the lower heart to the origin of form and spirit. Lower heart was talked about in the, in the previous section. And the lower heart is yin and the, and the upper heart is yang. So the origin of form and spirit, I guess, would be the upper heart. Within our six foot body, it said seven foot. Yes, in the previous section, it said seven foot. Now it's saying six foot. Within our six foot body, we must strive for the body, which existed before the laying down of heaven and earth. I guess that's the Dharma body. Nowadays, people sit and meditate one or two hours, still immersed in their lower self, and call this inner illumination. How can anything come of it? That's interesting because, you know, we say the same thing these days too. <laughs> it's like, you're meditating, but are you really meditating? No, you're just sitting there thinking about your thoughts, right? <laughs> you're, you're thinking about stuff. You're not really meditating. You, you're trying to meditate. Paragraph 14. The two founders of Buddhism and Taoism have taught that one should look at the tip of one's nose, but they did not mean that one should concentrate on the tip of the nose. Neither did they mean that while one's eyes are looking at the tip of the nose, one's thoughts should be concentrated on the middle yellow court, whatever that is. Wherever the eyes look, one's attention follows. How can one direct one's attention at two places at the same time? This is just like taking the finger pointing at the moon for the moon itself. This is fascinating because this is uh, also found in um, the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, to, to gaze at the tip of one's nose. But people say, well, that doesn't really mean look at the tip of your nose, you know, meditate on the tip of your nose. Um, um, this is saying, you know, you, you want to start there, but you don't want to keep focusing on the tip of your nose. Otherwise, you're going to become cross-eyed. Cross <laughs> Doesn't say that here, but 15. What then is really meant by this? The idea of focusing on the tip of the nose is very clever. The nose must serve the eyes as a guideline, but the nose itself is not the issue. If one's eyes are wide open, one looks into the distance so the nose is not seen. If the eyelids shut too much so that the eyes close, then again, the nose is not seen. When the eyes are open too wide, one's attention is easily scattered outward. When they are closed too much, one easily gets lost in dreamlike states. Only when the eyelids are lowered properly halfway, like this, is the tip of the nose seen in just the right way, and therefore it is taken as a guideline. So you, so you find the middle, <laughs> somewhere between eyes wide open and eyes wide shut, you find the, mid, the middle ground and you gaze at the tip of your nose, and that's the guideline. Um, okay. 16, the main thing is to lower the eyelids in the right way and then to allow the light to come in naturally. You don't need to make any special effort. Looking at the tip of the nose serves only as the beginning of the inner concentration so that the eyes are brought into the right direction for looking and then are held to the guideline. After that, one can let it be. That is the way a mason hangs up a plumb line. As soon as he has hung it up, he guides his work by it without continually bothering himself to look at the plumb line. All right, so you, you say, I guess what it's saying is you, 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 you close your eyes halfway, you look at the tip of your nose, and then you just, and I guess then you close your eyes because then you're, you're looking in the right direction. You don't need to keep looking at the tip of your nose. Um, you've got the plumb line. <laughs> I think that's what it's saying. I don't know, you know, but 17. Stopping and observing is a Buddhist method that originally was not secret. One looks attentively with both eyes at the tip of the nose, sits upright in a comfortable position, and focuses the heart around the center, which is called the yellow middle in Taoism. 
it not necessarily means the center of the head. It is only a matter of fixing one's attention on the point which lies between the two eyes. Light is some, something extremely volatile. When one fixes the attention on the midpoint between the two eyes, the light naturally enters. One doesn't need to direct the attention to the middle castle. These few words include all essential points. As for the rest, matters of entering and exiting stillness, the prelude and the aftermath, one can check the book Small Stopping and Observing for a reference. Well, I don't know if we have that book, but but I think what this is saying is that you, um, you know, you fix your attention at, why don't you fix your attention here, right, the third eye area? I don't know if that's what this is saying or if it's saying you focus here, the light enters, and then you don't have to keep focusing there. I don't know, you know. <laughs> the midpoint between the two eyes, I guess, is saying is right here, is, is the midpoint, tip of the nose. It's like you're making your eye single, right? You know, as Jesus says in the Gospels, you know, make your eye, make your eye single and your body will be filled with light. So maybe this is a reference to Christianity, here you know could be um 18 focusing around the center is a very subtle expression the center is omnipresent the whole universe is contained in it this indicates the crucial point of creation and through this one enters the gate one takes focusing as a hint so that one doesn't become rigidly fixed so you don't want to become rigidly fixed i guess you just want to start by focusing, but you don't want to be rigid, rigid about it. This expression is alive and subtle. Right? You don't want to, you want to let go of the rigidity. So it's, so it's alive and subtle. Focusing around the center. That's what you want to do is you want to focus around the center. The center is omnipresent. The whole universe is contained in the center. I'll let you read this on your own, you know. <laughs> you figure this out. I don't know. I'm not going to figure it out for you. Paragraph 19. Stopping and observing are inseparable. They mean concentration and insight. When thoughts arise, you don't need to sit still as before, but you should investigate this thought. Where is it? Where does it come from? Where does it go? Repeat this inquiry, inqu inquiry until you realize it cannot be grasped. Then you will see where thoughts arise. After that, you don't need to seek out the point of arising anymore. Having looked for my mind, I realize it cannot be grasped. I have pacified your mind for you. I don't know what that means. I have pacified your mind for you. Um, you investigate the thoughts. Where is the thought coming from? You know, you investigate the arising of the thoughts and, and the departing of the thoughts. Have you ever done that meditation where you just watch your thoughts? Where did it come from? Where is it going? <laughs> and you realize it cannot be grasped. Then you will see where thoughts arise. Then you don't need to seek it anymore. <laughs> it's all fascinating. You know, I think just reading this is bringing up some things. And that's why I think it's positive to read this, even though we may not be fully comprehending it. But... But we're, um, it's, it's, it's doing something, it's doing something. 20, this is right observation. What opposes this is incorrect. Once one realizes it cannot be grasped, one keeps practicing stopping, followed by observing, and keeps practicing observing, followed by stopping. This is the double cultivation of stopping and observing. This is turning the light around. The turning around is stopping, the light is observing. Stopping and observing, that's turning the light around, right? Stopping without observing is called turning around without light. Observing without stopping is called having the light without turning it around. Remember this. So this is turning around the light. This chapter is called turning around the light and keeping to the center. I think this last two paragraphs really kind of say it all, is that you, you, you're getting to the to the fundamental question of where is thought coming from, 
right? Where, where are the thoughts in the mind? Where do they come from and where do they go? Sometimes you need to stop Um, I guess that means stopping means sitting still, right? And sometimes you can observe without stopping. You can just be in observation without, without sitting still in meditation. I believe that's what it's saying. It might, may, I could be wrong. Um, stopping and observing. So there's a double cultivation of stopping and observing. Not exactly clear, but I think the idea of, you know, it says when thoughts arise, you don't need to sit still as before, but you should investigate this thought. So you don't need to stop. Okay, stopping and observing are inseparable. They mean concentration and insight. Right, so stopping would be concentration and observing is insight. All right, someone out there maybe help help us out here. But um, anyway, that's it for tonight. I went way over what I said I was we we're gonna do, but you know, it's all for the um, for the greater enlightenment. And uh, hope 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 it was helpful. Thank you for tuning in. We're gonna do chapter four. Chapter four is coming up next. Oh man, it's also a long one. Um, turning around the light and turning and tuning the breathing. It's going to be fun, I'm sure. See you soon. Thank you.